You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. If you spent any of your Thanksgiving holiday traveling, I hear you. And spare a thought for NASA Administrator Bill Nelson who hit the road the weekend after Thanksgiving, such a notoriously busy travel weekend, and took long-haul flights to see his friends in India and the United Arab Emirates. There's no time for a turkey-induced tryptophan food coma when we're talking about cooperation between nations on space initiatives. T-minus. 20 seconds to LOS. Idris. Go for the floor. Today is November 27th, 2023. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. NASA visits India and the UAE to discuss space cooperation. Kratos wins an IDIQ contract from Space Systems Command. Axiom goes all in with AWS. And our guest today is Tim Reed, CEO of Mojave Air and Spaceport. Stay with us. Happy Monday, everybody. Let's dive into our Intel briefing to kick off the week. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson is spending some quality time with fellow space officials in India and the UAE this week. While in India, Nelson will be visiting multiple locations in the country, including several ISRO facilities. One of them is in Bengaluru, where the first joint ISRO and NASA satellite mission, an Earth-observing synthetic aperture radar spacecraft called NISAR, is currently being tested prior to its 2024 launch. And after his visit to India, Nelson will be stopping by COP28 in Dubai. And that's the United Nations Climate Change Conference, which is starting just two days from now. It'll be the first time a NASA administrator will be at the Climate Change Conference. And Nelson will be there to talk about how space assets, and specifically NASA-provided space assets, give Earth science data to help make decisions relating to climate change and its impacts. Kratos Defense and Security Services has been awarded an Indefinite Delivery, Indefinite Quantity, or IDIQ, contract from Space Systems Command to provide satellite communication support to the U.S. Space Force and Space Systems Command. The potential eight-year, $579 million U.S. dollar contract includes a $146.3 million dollar task order for the continuation of Command and Control Sustainment Services, as well as systems and software engineering and modernization. The contract will also seek to address challenges in data sharing and obsolete technologies within the Space Force's Military Satellite Command. The U.S. Space Training and Readiness Command, also known as STARCOM, has released its latest Space Doctrine publication, 
And that's the first operational-level doctrine publication developed by STARCOM for the U.S. Space Force. The document presents the U.S. Space Force's approach to establishing and maintaining space domain awareness as part of unified action to support the freedom to operate in, from, and to space. The full document can be found in our show notes for you. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has released a request for information to inform the development of the congressionally mandated National Plan for Civil Earth Observations. The office has released a draft of the 2023 National Plan with the RFI, and they're seeking public input on how to leverage civil Earth observations to increase access to Earth data and address global changes. And as with the earlier story, we've included the RFI in our show notes for you. Axiom Space has announced that it's going all in on Amazon Web Services, or AWS, in support of its terrestrial information technology infrastructure. Axiom says by migrating its enterprise IT to AWS, the company will provide its engineers, ground operations, and business development teams the terrestrial cloud infrastructure necessary to enable development of its next-generation commercial space station, Axiom Station. Axiom Space and AWS say they will continue to collaborate on validating cloud-based hardware and software capable of supporting in-space workloads. These include scientific research and discovery that Axiom Space supports on orbit to benefit new pharmaceuticals development, stem cell research, regenerative medicine, and other areas of study in the microgravity environment. Axiom Space and AWS are also collaborating on the development and demonstration of in-space cybersecurity solutions that set the foundation for operating a cybersecure Axiom station. Very cool. We look forward to sharing more details and updates in the coming months. Europe's Ariane 6 heavy lift rocket passed a crucial engine burn last week, keeping it on track for a debut liftoff sometime next year, fingers crossed. The teams conducted a complete launch countdown, followed by a seven-minute full firing of the core stages engine, just as it would fire on a launch into space. The trial was conducted with a test model on the launch pad at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana, and it was the longest full-stack run yet for Ariane 6's lower liquid propulsion module with the Vulcan 2.1 engine. The UK Space Agency has announced new funding for 23 space projects to boost sovereign space capabilities. And amongst the recipients is OrbitFab, who have received £228,000 to enhance satellite servicing solutions that support sustainable space operations. Say that five times fast. OrbitFab will be using the funding for the development of a new in-space refueling system known as the GRASP. Now, GRASP stands for grasping, and resupply active solution for propellants. Kind of a backronym. Other recipients include University Research Programs, MDA Space and Robotics UK, Fraunhofer Center for Applied Photonics UK, and Oxford Dynamics. According to the Korean Central News Agency, Pyongyang's first military satellite is operating nominally following its launch last week. The state media reported that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has inspected spy satellite images of major target regions, including the South Korean capital and the U.S. military base at Pearl Harbor. Analysts say that it is too early to determine the capabilities of the satellite. South Korean intelligence officials have said that Pyongyang was able to launch the satellite after two failed attempts with assistance from Russia. And Aerospace New Zealand has appointed its first minister for space. Judith Collins will play a pivotal role in driving the space sector forward in the country, focusing on nurturing space-related activities, boosting advanced aviation, and streamlining the efficacy of regulatory frameworks. New Zealand is among an elite group of just 11 countries capable of orbital launches, and they're aiming to grow the space sector's value to 10 billion New Zealand dollars by 2030. That concludes our briefing for this Monday. You'll find links to further reading on all the stories that we've mentioned in our show notes. And as always, we've included a few extra stories for you. One is on why Europe is joining the new dash to the moon. There's another on the work of Guardians monitoring space debris. 
And there's a third on football. <laughs> and Alice says that I should mention that I'm referring to American Chuck Ball. Listen, I'm not getting into that whole fight. I'm not. Anyway, Vikings quarterback Joshua Dobbs gave an interview on his love of space. And if you like football and space, you should check that one out. All this and more at space.n2k.com. Hey, T-Minus crew. Every Monday, we produce a written intelligence roundup, and it's called Signals in Space. So if you happen to miss any T-Minus episodes, this strategic intelligence product will get you up to speed in the fastest way possible. It's all signal, no noise. And you can sign up for Signals in Space in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Our guest today is Tim Reed, CEO of Mojave Air and Spaceport. I started off by asking Tim to tell us what a day is like at the California Spaceport. Every day is different. And that's what I love about Mojave. And that's what really attracted me to Mojave is I don't know how to put it any other way. If you're an aviation or a space geek, it's, it's your dream come true. We work with so many different aircraft and so many different testing vehicles. And um, we're paving the way of the future for both space travel and high-speed flight. I mean, we're, we're the, the proving ground for these types of concepts. I've never worked anywhere that um, in my career where instead of saying, no, there's a reg on that, you say, uh, let's see how we can do this so it's as safe as humanly possible. <laughs> so let me have a change of pace. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh, my gosh. For, for someone like me who's heard about it but never been, can you can you maybe give me like a little like audio virtual tour? Like what what's there? What what would I see if I go? OK, I'm going to I'm going to play it to you like how I was introduced to Mojave on my very first day. And it was wonderful. Uh, the fuels guy comes in, the fuels director and says, hey, you want to see something cool? Now, if you work in aviation, that's always an entry to an awesome thing, right? It takes me out to the taxiway and watch a couple of F-18s take off that did a hot fuel. I know, gee whiz, ooh, F-18s, but we get practice uh, aircraft in from uh, Edwards Air Force Base, so F-35s, F-22s, uh, also with China Lake. I uh, I remember, uh, you know, going down to the Strato and uh, having their first uh, taxi test that I experienced, and uh, that huge aircraft rocked, the world's largest aircraft. Six 747 engines. Uh, that, that plane is so wide, the engines overhang our 200 foot wide uh, runway, which is amazing. Virgin Galactic and the Faith Hanger. Uh, we have several other type uh, testing entities and companies mixed in, such as like uh, Northrop Grumman, the Stargazer, the only L 1011 in operation in the world at Mojave. And it's a horizontal launch vehicle for the Pegasus uh, rocket. So, um, I mean, just seeing an L-1011, oh my God, I've never even seen one before until I came to Mojave. We have a National Test Pilot School. These guys, they're the only test pilot school in the United States. Impressive. They fly all sorts of aircraft, and these guys are all aeronautical engineers getting their master's degrees and becoming flight test uh, pilots and engineers. And that's fascinating to me. Uh, we have Universal Hydrogen. We have uh, Supernal. Both of the, uh, those entities are just testing at Mojave right now. Um, ODES, which is another uh, EV tall entity that's testing at Mojave. Uh, of course, scale composites, guys, burnt rutan. I didn't even know that that's where the long easies were designed and uh, not manufactured, but where they made the kits, right? I mean, you know, just like the hangar for um, the Voyager aircraft that flew around the world nonstop, it's still in existence today and used. You know, we have a, a company called Gauntlet that flies L 39 chase aircraft for various types of missions. Lots of things going on at Mojave. Actually, we just got a flying school too, which uh, kills me. It's um, there's so much demand for flight instruction there. 
I almost forgot BAE is also based in Mojave as well. And then we do have a couple of really interesting industries that uh, like uh, Progress Rail, which is a big name in the railroad industry. Railroad. Uh, they re- they fix, yeah, I believe it or not, there's a uh, company that fixes the rail car wheels and reconditions them on the property, along with Ecotech that uh, makes, um, they do a certain type of dyeing um, or a, a process with tools that are used in aviation, but not directly. So yeah, we have all sorts of things going on there. One of the most recent things that we heard about Mojave in the news was in relation to the Virgin Galactic layoff news. You gave some really great context about what that means for you guys. Could you could you sort of refresh my memory on what Virgin Galactic's layoffs mean for Mojave? I'm just going to start this off with that an airport, I'd probably be more, more concerned. Um, at a spaceport, uh, I'm noticing a trend in the industry where there's ebbs and lulls. So, uh, but one of the things I really want to point out with uh, Virgin Galactic is they were intending to move most of their operations over to New Mexico uh, anyways and some production in Arizona. So this isn't a surprise to us. Mojave's a test site, a uh, proving ground. So our tenants are supposed to be transient in, in a lot of ways. There are some anchor tenants and I you know, I hate to see a company go because I'm not going to work with them anymore, but they've completed their mission at Mojave and they're moving on to the next stage, which is passenger transportation. And Mojave is just not suited for passenger service at any level. The thing that strikes me talking to you, and I've, I've spoken to a number of people about different spaceports, they're all so different. What's going on is like different personalities, different activities. I'm going to ask oh, uh, probably a question you're probably sick of being asked, but you guys are also close to L.A. and the entertainment industry. What is that like trying to not only manage all these clients, but then you, I'm sure, get all these requests for people to film stuff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's got to add a layer to your job. Well, you know, it, it, that's what's kind of cool about Mojave. Um, we don't really advertise this too much, but, uh, you know, the Boneyard uh, gets uh, utilized for filming lots and lots of requests, and they make money off of that, which is great. Uh, the Boneyard also, believe it or not, is not just an aircraft storage place or a place for aircraft destruction. Um, it's used for training uh, for law enforcement entities, military entities to, to learn how to egress uh, or ingress uh, aircraft. The Boneyard is by far the most popular attraction. And um, believe it or not, I get a lot of requests from KLM flight crews uh, to, to tour because one of their former, uh, their last or their first MD-11 is uh, in the Boneyard and they always want to come by and see it. So um, actually giving tours, I've learned an awful lot from our visitors about the aircraft and what they flew. And it, this is interesting if you're an aviation geek, KLM has a uh, combination 747s or combi. 747. So they had a front part with passengers and the back part with uh, cargo. Do you imagine what that cargo was? Arabian horses. I asked one of the flight attendants, does anybody complain about that? They said, I occasionally get somebody that says it smells like a barn in here. <laughs> what would you want to share with people about what they should know about Mojave, maybe that we haven't touched on? Because I, I kind of have like my interest, in, <laughs> like my own personal pet interest, but yeah. No, you, you, you uh, Maria, you hit the nail on the head. Each uh, spaceport has its own kind of unique mission um, that ties into the entire um, space and testing and and uh, launching operations. So it Mojave is, out of all the spaceports, we're the, the proving ground, we're the testing facility. So we operate differently. We have the R2508 complex right above us that's uh, a joint use um, with uh, the Navy and the Air Force. Um, we have a high-speed corridor access, actually two high-speed corridor access. So um, in the near future, both uh, supersonic and hypersonic testing will probably be something that is in high demand at Mojave. Um, so like we see with Boom Supersonic right now, and they're preparing for their first flight, the XB-1 at, at Mojave. So I anticipate that being more of our thrust in the future. And so we're kind of changing how we approach um, the types of uh, customers that we want to serve. When I came on board, I noticed, hey, if everybody's testing, then you need to kind of anticipate transit operations. So we need to, to increase the number of facilities that are available, like hangars that are specifically used for temporary basis for testing and um, modifications as necessary. So you, you mentioned hypersonic. So do you anticipate this is specifically like point-to-point testing uh, that is on the horizon for you guys? Yes, I, I can see that Mojave has a very good future with hypersonic and supersonic testing because hypersonic testing speeds, um, you need to ex- exceed, I think it's Mach 5 to Mach 7 
So get this, in the United States, any kind of high-speed corridor that's over land is uh, regulated to Mach 1. Now, there's some work that's being done to, to work on that because the environmental hazard, the sonic boom. Well, at Mojave and Edwards Air Force Base in China Lake, there's two high-speed military corridors that can be used for flight testing. It's a little tricky, but we're trying to figure out a process right now to streamline it. Those high-speed corridors, because they're military, do not have speed limits, period. So if you're one of the only uh, air or space ports in pro close proximity to that, it just makes sense that our thrust really needs to be more on the experimental side and testing of hypersonic aircraft. So a lot of this we were talking about is horizontal. Any thoughts on vertical launch? Uh, vertical launch is really challenging in Mojave because of the property and the amount of property that you need for a vertical launch, a single vertical launch. Uh, where we're located, we'd have to close down two highways, a railroad, and um, clear out an awful lot of the airport in order to do a vertical, a singular vertical launch. So it's, it's very limited. But that's fine. Uh, you know, we are a licensed horizontal launch facility. So that made sense with uh, Strato Launch, even though Strato Launch is really focusing on hypersonic testing right now, which is hilarious when you see this huge airplane and this tiny little article in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's cute. I, I, I don't know. It's a, I don't know how to put it any other way, but it's... Um, I've never heard it described as cute, and I kind of love that. <laughs> but... They did acquire Virgin Orbit's assets, including the, the 747, which they're going to repaint and then do a naming ceremony here very soon. We'll be sure to keep you guys in the loop. I anticipate that will be used for horizontal uh, launch operations with some modifications as well. Well, that's, that's I mean, uh, it's no shade on vertical or horizontal. I think like I think horizontal is really cool as well. So I think that's just, it's, it's I just think it's neat. So <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I I, I just, I don't know why it's not taken off, no pun intended. But no, there just seems to be a little bit of a lull in horizontal launch operations. But that's fine. There's, you know, other things that we're focusing on as well. So there is an amateur rocketry site, uh, Friends of Amateur Rocketry. It's about 11 miles north of Mojave that you can get up to the, the Carmen um, line uh, with the clearance that they have through the R2508 complex. This is, ties in very, very important for Mojave because we have potential tenants that need to launch small rockets that want to base their operation at Mojave but need to test out at that test site. And the Friends of Amateur Rocketry tend to be pretty amicable to that kind of testing. But the reason why it's so important is uh, we are actually hosting our first collegiate uh, ro mo amateur rocketry uh, competition. Um, I think we have 360 uh, entrants so far. <laughs> so it'll All be right. the first... It'll be the first of June. We'll get the word out. Uh, we're still getting the word out to colleges and universities. But we also, on the following week, have another collegiate competition, a 3D model printing and uh, UAV uh, course competition that's hosted by uh, CSULA. So Nice. Yeah, we're, we're bringing the community and the public out and trying to educate them more, especially college students and the different tenants and people that they could potentially work for in the future, while at the same time, giving our tenants the opportunity to scout talent. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's Cyber Corps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Welcome back. You might have noticed over the course of the show that we really like highlighting student rocketry here at T-minus. 
Yeah, it is the cool factor of getting to launch your own rocket, and there really is nothing like hands-on learning to inspire the up-and-coming leaders of tomorrow. So, in that spirit, if you are or know a university student in Canada, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, Slovenia, or any of the 22 ESA member states, and getting the chance to launch a rocket is of interest, listen up. The ESA Education Office is looking for up to 100 eligible students to fly a rocket. That's what it's called, fly a rocket exclamation point. And this program provides an online course about rocketry at the undergraduate level. And the top 24 students who take that course will then be eligible to try a hands-on sounding rocket launch over a week at Andoya Spaceport in Norway. So, you have to apply for the program by December 3rd to take the course, and then you have to be in the upper quartile of students in that course. But yeah, do all that, and you could launch your own rocket. And not to bury the lead here, well, yes, you do have to be able to do some higher-level math in this program, go figure. You do not have to be studying aerospace engineering or even science to apply for this program. ESA says they are specifically looking for a wide variety of interested students from all areas of study. So, my fellow humanities space geeks, I know you're out there. This is your opportunity. Don't miss it. That's it for T-minus for November 27th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector. From the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at N2K.com. This episode was produced by Alice Caruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester. With original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.